Hi, everyone. It's Katie Gordon. I'm coming to you live on this wonderful Sunday evening and Monday for many of you. Um, we're doing another live broadcast, and today, um, oh, before I forget, I always forget these things. If you have any questions that you want um, me or my guest, Cara, to answer, you can tweet them to me at Katie Morton, or you can use the hashtags ED Solutions or SH Solutions, like self harm solutions. And you can put that hashtag in, and we will answer them at the end of our broadcast. So hop on there and put those up so that we make sure we'll get through as many as we can. Um, but if we don't get to yours, you can always let me know and I'll answer it you know, afterwards on my Twitter account. Okay? Um, and also, if you're in a weird time zone and you're supposed to be getting ready for school, you're going to get in trouble. Hang up. You can watch this later. It will be on my website. It will be on my YouTube channel. You'll be able to catch it. Don't worry. And if you have a question you need to be answered, just ask us now, and then we'll get to it, and you won't get in trouble. Okay? We don't want anybody getting in trouble. <laughs> okay, so I want to introduce to you my guest, Cara Vaughn. And she's all the way over in Australia, so it's Monday morning for you, right? Yeah. So this is Cara, and she has a lot of experience with what we're going to talk about today. And I just want to let Cara know how excited I am and how grateful I am for your willingness to share your story and your willingness to, you know, everything about your experience and the things that work for you and not work for you is so powerful, and it's something that I can't do. And I really am so grateful for you sharing and taking the time out of your day to spend with me. Um, and you have no idea how powerful it is. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. And um, I think we'll get going. So our first topic is something that many of you have asked about. And I know that Cara has worked a lot on this herself. So that's part of the reason I was, I'm really excited to have her on board today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about borderline personality disorder. Now, I know that a lot of people, my biggest pet peeve with this is that a lot of people give it a negative title. Like, if you have a personality disorder, that means that something is severely wrong with you, blah, blah, blah. I don't like that at all. I, I think that everything that we ever get diagnosed with or anything we ever struggle with is just that. It's a struggle. It's an obstacle. That doesn't mean that anything is anything wrong with us, that doesn't mean that we can't fight and we can't win. Because Cara's worked really hard and I know she's done a lot of her work and it definitely pays off, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, DBT has pretty much saved my life, so. Yeah, so I, I mean, we're both here today to prove to you that borderline personality disorder as well as dialectical behavioral therapy are things that can work really well together and you can work through your borderline personality disorder. It doesn't have to be that, okay? And if somebody has told you something or somebody says, I don't work with people with that, find somebody else because you are so strong, you can do this and we can fight together. So the first thing I want to touch on is just what is it? Because some of us, if we haven't had anybody around us diagnosed with it or if we haven't been diagnosed, many of us don't have a clear idea of what what it really is, what it really means day to day, okay? So I have some notes, so I'm going to reference my notes so that I don't miss anything or leave anything out. You know? um, okay, hold on one sec. Okay, I'll take off my little thing so you can see me better. Okay, so borderline personality disorder is something that it's a condition that people get when they have a kind of a, a long-term pattern of unstable or turbulent emotions. That's kind of the diagnosis, you know, I'm just quoting exactly what they call it, what they say it is. Um, and it, it kind of relates to our feelings about ourselves and our feelings about how we interact with others, if that makes sense. So it's the reason that I think it becomes a problem for a lot of people is because it's really hard on our relationships. And we will find that we'll either really be scared that people are going to leave us or we will leave people. And it kind of ties into the way that we, we respond to one another and how we interact. And that's why I think it's really important that we find out if we do struggle with this 
because we can work on it and your relationships can blossom and grow and you can have great friendships and great boyfriends and girlfriends, loving relationships. Um, and I think that's why I became really passionate about it and um, I myself am a certified DBT therapist and I work with it with many of my clients. Um, so I think it's definitely something that, I mean, Cara and I were just talking before this about how everyone can benefit from it. I can benefit from it. I feel like when I was going through my training, I was learning just as much as any of my, my people in my group. <laughs> so it's something we can all find useful. Um, is you know when we're working with the DBT therapy part and we're working with the borderline. So okay, back to borderline. Sorry, I'm, I'm meshing the two. I'll try to keep them separate. So borderline personality disorder. The main causes that they say um, to create this in us is an abandonment in childhood or adolescence, disrupted family life. This can mean mom and dad getting divorced. This can mean a really emotional, difficult move. Um, it can be anything. Someone passing away that's really close to us. Um, then they also talk a lot about having poor communication in the family and how that can be really disruptive and hard for us. And that kind of, in my mind, all of these things I'm talking about are also ways that eating disorders are created and why we have an eating disorder. And the last one they talk about is sexual abuse. And I know many of you have had um, something horrible, a horrible trauma like this happen to you. And that can also be attributed to the borderline personality disorder. Now, um, the symptoms that they talk about with borderline are fear of being abandoned. And I talked about this in another video. I know many of you, um, if you haven't been following me from the very beginning or haven't had a chance to go back and watch the other videos, um, the fear of abandonment video, I talk a lot about how we either push people away or we smother people and it kind of because we haven't had a really safe and secure bond as a child and so we don't know how to create that in our adult life. And, um, that's something that be, um, doing the DBT therapy it can really help with that. Also um, feelings of emptiness which I know a lot of us struggle with with eating disorders and with self-harm um, because this issue borderline it happens just as much to people who self-harm as well as people with little eating disorders. It's, it's very common. Um, also, this is the most common one that I see and why people that come to me is um, frequent displays of inappropriate anger and suicidalness. So we'll have suicidal ideation, we will try to commit suicide, um, and we can have outbursts of rage. I mean, I've had clients who bang their heads against walls, they've thrown stuff, they've broken things, they get really angry. Um, and then obviously, suicidality um, can be really scary for us as well as people around us. Um, and that's usually why they come in for help, where they're forced in for help. Um, and then also, the last thing I want to touch on before I'll, I'll talk a little bit more is ways that we can also notice that we're we are struggling with borderline personality disorder is impulsive use of money, substance abuse, sexual relationships, binge eating, um, and even shoplifting sometimes. I've had some clients who have uh, binge eaters. They go to the grocery store and they try to walk out with a cart full of food without paying for it. Um, I know that sounds like who, why would we do that, but sometimes we're not thinking clearly. We're overrun with emotion. Um, and that's part of kind of what work is. We feel very run over with our emotions. Um, so, Cara, your experience with uh, borderline, and what, how did you come about the di getting diagnosed, and how did you? Um, well, when I was first diagnosed, um, when I was 18, so quite a few years ago, um, I was in denial, and I didn't actually know much about it. I had heard from somebody that it was untreatable, that um, there was no hope and that it would be with me for life um, and that's why I also rejected the idea that it, I could be suffering from that. Um, but it wasn't until years later of struggling with that I, I recognised yeah, and I knew something was wrong and it was actually other people that pushed me into treatment um, even though I did know that I needed help. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, thanks for sharing. And I know um, that that's what I why I think I want to talk about it, and I'll continue to talk about it more. Is because people say things like that, like it's stuck with you for the rest of your life, and there's nothing you can do. I mean, I I find in the mental health community a lot of people don't have bedside manner. You know when you're in the hospital and they find out something's wrong with you, they have somebody that comes in there and they try to explain what's going on and they're very soft and um, I'm sorry that this is happening but this is what we can do. You know and they kind of give us hope and okay well those are things that we can do and this is my you know prognosis blah blah blah. But when it comes to mental health a lot of people are really harsh and they'll say you know this is just what you have and you have to learn to live with it and there's nothing you can do and I'm here to tell you all that's a lie we can fight it. It's, it's like eating disorders and depression and suicidal ideation, all these things we struggle with. You can fight them. I've seen tons and tons of people fight it and win. You can't. There's nothing stopping you. You tell those people to shut up. And <laughs> I just find it really frustrating and it's hurtful. You know? So, um, on to the, just the finishing up of what borderline is, because I know a lot of you have people in your life who you wanted to have something to explain it to them, or a way to share, um, or even a greater understanding for yourself. If you're newly diagnosed and you're like Cara and somebody told you something, um, and you're wondering really what it is and how you can help yourself and what to do, um, you know, continue watching because that's that's what I'm hoping to do here. So. Um, the one thing that I wanted to draw the parallel is a lot of the risk factors for borderline are the same as the risk factors for eating disorders. Um, and in my, in my mind, the reason why I feel that all of this is, easy, is something that we can overcome is it all is around communication, talking about how we feel, communicating with people about what's upsetting, what's, what's okay, what's not okay, how I want to be treated. The more we can express ourselves, and the more we can talk about it, and we can say, um, yeah, I'm struggling with an eating disorder. This is what I'm going through. I'm struggling with self-harm. And this is what it looks to me. This is what it looks like. And this is how it feels. If we can share that, the more we can share that, the less power all of that has over us. Because I think that these kinds of things live in the secrets. Our eating disorder or self-harm, it lives in the secret. It like thrives in this you're too afraid to share and you're shameful for this. You should be embarrassed. You should not be embarrassed. There's no shame in any of this. This is something we're struggling with and these are things we can work on. Okay? Let's keep that in mind. Um, so that's really as much as I, I feel. I mean, is there anything you think I'm missing, Clara, about borderline? Like just explain kind of what it is? No, I think you got it right, pretty right. <laughs> Yeah. It's just, I feel like the best way to describe it to people, if loved ones are worried and they don't understand, just say, I'm learning to get in better control of my emotions because right now my emotions are like a semi truck. They're like running through me and I, I can't even handle it, really. Yeah. yeah. And we'll lash out, we will act out, we'll do anything. I mean, think about it. When any of us are in a really bad state of mind, and we don't really act ourselves. We don't really act from a conscious mind. We act from, I don't know, like really nilly. We throw caution to the wind. I'm just, you know, doing something without thinking. So that's really the way I describe borderline to people. And let them know that it is something we can overcome. It's something we can fight and we can win. Okay. okay, so that's that's borderline personality disorder, or BPD, which is easier to say because it's a mouthful, as well as DBT, because it's dialectical behavioral therapy. So I'll call it DBT. <laughs> this is what I'm, I, uh, I'm getting a weird echo, so hold on one sec. We had this happen last time. I don't know why, but like I said, I'm not that tech savvy. So give me one sec, I'm going to mute and fix it.
Okay, I think that fits it. I think it's just. Hold on, it's not fixed. Is it, I don't know if it's bothering people. Is it bothering you, Carl? No. I know. I don't. Let me see. Nope, I'm not getting any, any comments. Ah. Rachel says that it, when you said, hold on. Oh, it's, they think it's your speaker, Carl. Um. If, but why? Maybe if I mute you in between, let me try. See if that goes away. Yeah, no more echo. Okay, so when I want to toggle to you, I'll just turn your speaker back on. Is that okay? Okay, sorry. I don't know why it's acting weird. Okay, so that's fixed. Sorry, everybody. I'm always fighting with the echo. <laughs> okay, back on track. So, um, now we're going to talk a little bit about DBT therapy, and like I said, it stands for Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, and if none of you have ever heard of it or ever worked with anybody who specializes in it, I would encourage you to Google it. Um, I know that I have looked online, I mean it's been a while since I've looked it up, but I'm always curious because I want to make sure things online are accurate and really what we want to hear, and I know that Wikipedia actually has a really great rundown of what it is and it kind of walks you through a little bit about it and you, it's actually pretty useful they give you a lot of the tools in there so um, if any of you just want to check it out and just see I would encourage you to Google you can just Google DBT therapy and look for the Wikipedia link okay um, so just to give you a little um, I guess behind the scenes where it, where it was created when it was created what we do with DBT because I know lots of you whenever we talk about it starting a new therapy regimen can be kind of scary and really the fear is just because we don't know we don't know what we're signing up for and everybody's like oh this really works for me but you're thinking I don't know if it's gonna work for me so I'll give you a little bit of a rundown and I know that Cara has worked really hard on her DBT therapy and so she's gonna share a little bit about her what worked for her um, and maybe what was hard or what was easier and stuff like that. So when I finish with this, I'll toggle over to you, Car, and I'll turn your <laughs> microphone back on. So, um, so DBT therapy was originated by this woman, everybody, it, Marsha, we call her, Marsha um, Linham, and she's a psychology researcher at um, University of Washington. What? UW? I grew up around there, so <laughs> I'm a Husky fan. Um, so anyway, and it was because there wasn't really any treatment for borderline personality disorder people. And that's why I'm doing these at the same time, because to talk about borderline and tell you that we can work on it and we can fight through it and overcome it, and then not to give you any tools is, isn't helpful at all. <laughs> so um, DBT therapy was started for BPD people. And it combines, um, a lot of times if you don't have a DBT therapist in your area, I know for many of you I've said, oh, find someone who does CBT, Cognitive Behavior Behavioral Therapy, which I know they do have in the UK. It's very easy to find um, most of the psychiatrists and psychologists over there do use CBT therapy um, because it combines CBT therapy with um, a little bit more focus on emotion regulation. Now, you know how I said with borderline, it's like our, a semi-truck running through with emotion. We're just like, ah, it's overwhelming. 
and our emotions are like, we feel like we have no control. We want to scream sometimes, and we want to cry, we want to do both at the same time. <laughs> so um, this is kind of, this is how we work on it. And that's why it's hard, because I know for many of you, when you message me and you're like, Katie, I'm freaking out. I, I have no, I'm at the end of my rope. What am I supposed to do? I feel like I want to binge and purge, or I feel like I want to cut, and I want, I want to do it right now. Um, that's when we're filled with emotion. And we need to find a way to kind of bring it down, and breathe, and relax. And this is kind of what helps to do this. It's really hard. It's not easy. It's not like we can just flip a switch and we're in control of our emotions, which I'm sure Carr can t testify to the fact that it is pretty difficult. But it it's doable. And there's steps that you do. There's groups, usually. Um, traditional DBT therapy, you see a therapist like me um, for your sessions each week, and then you also uh, sit in, in a group. And they go for usually, I mean, the one that I used to run was two hours to two and a half hours. Um, we did, we kind of toggled between those two because it was in a day program, so it depended on our schedule, but at least two hours because they're pretty intense and there's a lot of information that we cover. So, um, also we talk a lot about distress tolerance, acceptance, and what everybody hates, mindfulness. Uh, I always hear people say, I hate that, I'm having so much trouble with it, blah, blah, blah. But it's really helpful, and this is something that we can all benefit from. Like I even was revisiting my, Cara and I were talking about re revisiting our DBT workbooks. I'm sure she has the, the opposite of the one that I have, because I have the like leader's guide, you know, and she probably has the participant's guide, and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I mean, a lot of it I use, but I'm, I'm like, wow, this is really helpful. I could use this myself. So it's not anything to be ashamed of trying. It's very helpful and it's very beneficial to our relationships. So um, uh, let's see what else. I want to make sure I do a thorough description, but DBT is very intense and there's a lot of details. So that's why I encourage you all to look it up and go through it online. But I just want to highlight some of the things I think will be helpful now, in the moment. Things you can take notes on and you can utilize without having to do um, too much research. So the one thing I get a lot of feedback and people say, why do you always say we or us or our? It's because of DBT. Um, I, I also work in treatment teams a lot, almost 99% of the time, so I'm always thinking as a we. We're all working together, right? I'm here to help you work harder, find out ways that you can beat that eating disorder and beat that self-harm urge and we can get through it. And so I use we a lot, but in DBT the focus is that the therapist is an ally. I'm like a, you know, like an ace up your sleeve. If any of you play poker, I don't, but that's the only analogy I can think of. So um, if uh, your therapist is someone that is there to help, we're here to support and we're not an adversary. I'm not fighting you. I'm not I might be fighting your eating disorder, and I know some patients will get frustrated because I'm a little feistier at their eating disorder, um, but I'm an ally, and I'm here to help, and DBT is kind of like that, and I'm walking you through it, and a lot of times um, I will utilize the time in the therapy session, so if something comes up, if people get really frustrated and anger, it comes out in the session, it's a great way to practice mindfulness, recognizing the emotion, and it's a great way to show that a relationship can handle emotion like that and we can process it and we can figure out where it came from and stuff like that so it's um, it's definitely great if you can find a therapist that works with DBT because they'll understand that aspect of it and they'll be more helpful as we work through this okay um, last little bit and I've got my notes so I don't forget anything um, I think the there I mean there there are four modules within DBT, but I'm just going to talk about two of them for right now. Um, and like I said, I'll, this is something that I'll revisit. Um, and I know Cara puts up a lot of videos of her own, and she also posts them on my website. And um, you know, she'll have some great insight to this stuff as well. Um, not to put any pressure on you, honey. Sorry. <laughs> but these are just things like I always talk about. We're creating this community, and. Um, I want everybody to help one another. We're here to share experiences and you know share what works and what doesn't work. And 
it can be really powerful. We have a powerful voice, you know, and every day we're growing, there's more people that are participating, and it just it's really exciting. So um, so the two things that I'll talk about, and then I'm gonna cut over to Kara so that she can share her experience, um, is the mindfulness that I was talking about. And I used to do this group, and if any of my old uh, group members are watching this, they're probably like, oh my God, but I used to do the mindfulness group, and I remember um, we had a particularly nice day at the clinic I worked at, and so we went out in the backyard, and we each laid down blankets, and I ran them through this kind of mindfulness practice, and we, what we did is, and I'm sure many of you have done this, and maybe not, but it's something we can do. Um, if you have kind of a day where you want to meditate and like relax and take some time for yourself and your recovery, is um, imagining those emotions. So anger, I don't know, guilt, uh, sadness, any of the things that we feel we can't feel. It's not okay. Our eating disorder or our self-harm voice says, you're not worth it, you can't feel that. And, and I, we can, it's okay. And what we did in this group is we practiced watching these emotions float by, whether it was in a stream and the emotions were on leaves that floated by. Cara, have you done this one before? <laughs> or they're on a, a cloud and the cloud goes by through this. <laughs> I know, she's laughing, but it, it's silly at first and you're like, oh, I hate you, Katie, for giving me this to do, blah, but it, for me even, I enjoy recognizing what thoughts go through my head and what emotions come up connected to those thoughts because a lot of times we run so fast during the day, we're go, 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 we have things to do, I have to get this appointment and then I have to do this and before we know it, we're overwhelmed and our emotions are, you know, making us crazy and so if we take some time to just acknowledge that they're there, that's what we felt because that's what we thought and just having that, that's a great way to start, I think, the mindfulness. It's a great way to just notice because a lot of what we do and a lot of what I tell everybody is just notice what's going on. You don't have to do anything about it yet. Just be aware. Okay, so that's kind of the mindfulness. So that's just what I'll leave you with for that um, because that can get really intense and um, I'm sure many of you are thinking, that if you've been through DBT, you're like, there is a lot to it, and yes, but that's kind of a starting point, and I like to give steps, because everything in its own time, right, we have to take our time a little bit. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is distress tolerance, and that's something that we can all benefit from, because those times when we can't even, um, we can't even notice what emotions are happening. We have those urges, right? Our eating disorder is screaming. He's like, you need to you need to binge, you need to purge, you need to restrict, you need to exercise, you need to do all sorts of things, and it's yelling. Or that voice to cut, I need to self-harm, it needs to happen now, we start planning, we start preparing for those. There, what do we do when we're distressed? Right? And that's usually the hardest time. It's the hardest time to stop anything, it's the hardest time to do anything, and the, this was something I was talking to Cara because I hadn't read it in so long that I forgot the exact, um, I think they, it's like an acronym that they give you for this and it's distracts with accepts, A-C-C-E-P-T-S, so accepts, right? A, activities. How many times do I tell you guys, go for a walk, paint your nails, call a friend, we're doing activities, we're distracting with activities. Um, you know, get out, take the dog for a walk, things like that, right? Then contribute, that's another one, C. It says help out others in your community or whatever, but hey, um, my mom is, is cleaning the house, what can I help out with mom, what can I do, or can I do this, or your dad's outside doing something, can I help out with that? I mean, just asking anybody, somebody, I'm going to help, I need to do something, it just keeps us busy, right? Then um, comparisons. And I know many of you are thinking, why the heck is that in there? I compare all the time and it's terrible. But we're comparing to people less fortunate. And in the States, unfortunately, we've had this horrible hurricane that swept through and it's devastating. I almost can't watch it on TV. It's so sad um, what it's done to people's homes. But if you haven't, if you're not falling victim to that, comparing yourself to that can really put things in perspective. And sometimes it's helpful if we're like, you know what? This 
isn't the end of the world right now because some people are out of their homes. They've lost their everything. And I'm more fortunate, right? I know that sounds horrible, but sometimes it helps us to, it grounds us, I guess. And sometimes that, if we can even do that in a split second, just thinking about that, that can really help. Um, the next one is emotions. So it says cause yourself, and I don't know if you remember doing this. This is one of, Cara, this one really cracked me up because a lot of my clients didn't like this one. But it's you provoke a sense of humor or happiness. I mean, some people I know, um, Rachel even said last time, like I watch some funny uh, TV shows or things on YouTube. Watch it just changes. It forces you out. You you can't. I can't cry anymore if, if I'm watching Thirty Rock. If anybody watches that show, I really like Thirty Rock, as well as New Girl. Very funny, right? We switch on something funny. You can even watch. I mean, the funny things on the YouTube. You know, there's so many ridiculous things. I, I mean, I watch. Uh, what's it? Tosh Point oh sometimes. That's ridiculous things people post on the internet. So we have access to all of that all the time. Um, and then push away. So it says put your situation on the back burner for a while. Now that one's really hard, and I know a lot of people have trouble, but you can put something else first. Like right now, like for instance, like let's say I'm having a bad day. I'm like, you know, I'm about to talk to Kara, and I have to get online, and this has to happen. So that's going to just go on the back burner. I don't have time to be mad right now. I'll do it later. Okay? And then um, I'll cut over to Cara. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you've experienced? I mean, I know that you've probably gone through these things. I'm going to turn your speaker on because it's, it's bothering me not having you participate. There we go. Um, but I know that a lot of these can be really hard. And have you been able to use any of these? Do these things help in the moment? Or what's your experience? Uh-oh. I can't hear you now. There you go. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, when I first started DVT, um, like you said, it was something different, something new. I didn't know what to expect. Um, but yeah, I did find it was really intense um, pretty much throughout the whole thing, and there was a lot of information. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I don't. I don't really know, like there were some skills that I was like, there's no way I'll ever be able to do them. And it takes a lot of practice and I think that's the hardest thing to accept because I'm not really a patient person. And just, yeah, trying to, just having the willingness to give things a go and, and that really helped. And now I do the skills and I don't even really think about it. It's just, it just happens. Yeah, and I think that's the cool thing is we practice so much. And that's why I always say we have to try it all the time. So even if you're not having a bad day, it's nice to practice the mindfulness because it comes, it just, it'll happen. You'll do it without thinking. You know? Yeah. So um, hold on one sec. My, I have to get my power cord. <laughs> this is my computer is low. Okay. Um, and do you do any of those more frequently than others? I mean, I know I went through a lot of them, and that's why it's kind of hard to do DBT in such a like a short. This is what it is. Um, but when I was talking about the accepts, I know I only did accept, but um, these are those the most helpful, or are you able to clients like to be able to put something on the back burner? And come back to it, or which ones do you find you do most? I guess. Um, I I don't really know for sure because I I'm I'm really like I, I always act to my emotion like straight away. If it's like a negative emotion, I will just um because I've already written a list of what helps me, um, and I've also listed it in like um, the amount of effort it would take. Um, just to do that kind of thing and I just kind of go down the list and find something that I want to do that I feel like I could do um, but I as long as I'm trying to do something then yeah I've got a chance of getting the emotion down yeah for a reason. yeah and I think it it's the it's practice it just takes practice 
and keeping our lists and keeping our notes and finding out what works. And I know I say that to a lot of you. Um, here, I'll toggle back over to me. Um, I know that I say that to a lot of you when you're saying, well, that didn't work for me and I'm really frustrated. And I'll say, just keep trying. You know, just keep at it. it. It doesn't happen. We don't just do things once. It's not like, for instance, I don't just pick up the guitar and know how to play. You know, trust me, I've taken some lessons and it's really hard. <laughs> Well, Cara is much better than I am. <laughs> um, but things take practice, and we have to keep at it and um, just know that we've been run by our emotions for a long time. That's usually why we're struggling with our eating disorder or we're struggling with self harm. So, you know, just practicing and trying new things each time. I, I even find, like, if you can print off um, some of the stuff about DBT and going through that accepts. Um, I didn't go through all of them, but that gives you an idea. And trying something new each time. And okay, well, I tried the push away and that didn't work. We scratch it off the list. We'll try something else, you know. Um, I find that the the emotions when you or what is it, the when you provoke a new emotion, like forcing it, the funny movies and the stuff to kind of pull us out really can help. And it's something that we can do pretty easily nowadays and also activities. I find those to be the two most effective with my clients and my experience. Um, so maybe give those a go first and we'll see if that helps. Okay? Yeah. So that's just a little bit about, oh did you want to say something Carl? Yeah. And also with the, um, by acting opposite to the emotion, um, one of my Twitter followers has told me that that's one of the most difficult skills for them and it really is hard because when you're in that emotion and you're like I want to isolate, I don't want anything to do with anyone, I just want to be alone with my thoughts, with my feelings, but it's not going to help. Um, so just, yeah, it's re it is really difficult but it took me time and then, yeah, just a little bit each time. Yeah, good. And, um, and it is, it's kind of, I always think it's like when we, when we're in that dark place or we're in that hard triggered place, it's usually one decision away. And it sometimes we have like that little bit of time and I know I always talk to my clients about like the 10 second, like the golden 10 seconds because there's usually that little period of time when we can try to fight or we can call that friend or we can hop online to turn on a movie. You know what I mean? It's that little and it takes a lot of work to find yeah. that golden 10 seconds. So Yeah, just just last night, like I was really upset and I was pulling my eyes out, but I made the decision to watch your video, the one on suicide, mm -hmm. and by the end of it, I was I was, I was calmed down and it, yeah, I'm so glad I decided to do that because it really helped. Yeah, and that, I mean, hooray, that was a huge success. That's something to add to your recovery journal. <laughs> yeah. You know, I did it. I chose, I... I pushed that emotion out and I chose another emotion, you know? So, yeah, good job, honey. Okay, so I'm going to take a peek really quick at people's questions just to make sure that none of them pertain to DBT and um, uh, BPD. Let's see. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay, I think we're good. The rest of it's like, um, I think the other things are pertaining to others, so we'll, we'll deal with them at the end. I just want to make sure if anybody had a question about that, that we were able to address it. Um, okay, so let me get rid of those things. The next topic that I want to talk about is is it echoing again? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'll come back. Um, so the next topic is eating disorders and substance abuse. I know that many of you have reached out to me and, and asked questions about it, or you've just told me in our different communications, whether we're, you know, direct messaging or talking on Twitter in general or YouTube. Um, you'll tell me about times when you've either drank too much or You've, um, you're addicted to different prescription pills or different. Um, so well, I know a lot of people have said that they um, they have you know they smoke pot a lot and it helps with their or their cravings and they can actually eat or it feeds their binge binging and purging and it feeds their bulimia. Um, so I guess 
this is a topic that, I mean, when I see patients, sorry, I'm all over the place because this one is a little, it's a little tricky because when I see clients, I always want to know if they have any substance abuse because most of the time I'll ask them to go to AA meetings or to even work on it first because it, it's my personal belief that we can't work on our eating disorder or our self-harm or any our you know if we are struggling with BPD we can't work on it if we're using alcohol and drugs and the reason for that is is because we're never really in a real state of mind we're not even in a place where we can actually get better because we can't even focus or we can't stay awake or we're, we won't even remember what happened or you know I mean we all know a lot of things come along with drinking a lot or using drugs a lot and the addiction of that um, and so most of the time I know that for me and for a lot of treatment centers they'll ask you to get treatment for that first so that's I'm just putting that out there so that many of you know um, you may want to go to an AA meeting if I think they have those worldwide but um, any kind of Alcoholics Anonymous or any group meetings that you have, those are free and they are all over. Um, and just start talking about it. It's the same thing as our eating disorder because it kind of hides in the secrets. And we keep it a secret. We pretend it's not a problem. We pretend that, you know, it's nothing uh, nothing to do with anything else. It's not a pro. I don't know. It, you know, we, it tells us a lot of lies, just like our eating disorder does. And it kind of keeps us stuck. And so... I would encourage you to work on that first and then work on the other things. Um, so that's kind of my thought on it previous to treatment. But okay, so let's say you, you have worked on it. The reason that I find most of my clients have struggled with substance abuse is almost the same reason that we have an eating disorder or we self-harm. It's a way of coping. It's a way of numbing out. It's a way of forgetting. Um, what else did I have? I think it's just another way of ignoring emotions rather than communicating them. And so, um, okay, so I don't know. Carl, what are your thoughts? I'm going to take you off mute here. What are your thoughts on substance abuse? And um, yeah, well, Mine's, yeah, like I've had experience with substance abuse, um, but I'm not really sure which came first. Like, with, I think my depression obviously came first. And then to deal with my BPD, that's that's kind of when I um, started abusing alcohol and um, sleeping tablets. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of people have that. It's We usually end up taking downers. I know that that sounds... It's like generalizing, but I find in my experience a lot of my most of my clients drink. That's the number one problem. That's the number one thing that I have um, people struggle with, and benzodiazepines, benzos, um, the downers, the sleeping pills, and the things like that. Um, and I think part of the reason that we do is because of the fact that many of us struggle with depression, so it almost validates the emotion. I feel down. I feel like shit or whatever. You know, I'm gonna. I just want to wallow in it. Sometimes we want to wallow, you know? And it kind of helps that along. Um, let's see. Sorry, right, I have questions coming through, so I want to make sure that I don't forget them. Um, okay. Um, Okay, there's a, I have a question from someone um, that their therapist worries about her drinking because um, does it purging alcohol is dangerous. And oh, I have to mute you again. Um, so she says that she worries um, about that and that it's dangerous. And I honestly, other than the other than the medical side of the fact that alcohol dehydrates us. I think for me that'd be the biggest fear because I like I always tell so many of you when you're telling me that you're feeling like heart uh, cramps or palpitations which I was supposed to have another um, guest on as well but she's on her way to the hospital because she was having some chest pains and for those of us who binge and purge 
um, and purge in general or abuse laxatives, diet pills, diuretics, things like that, we're dehydrating our body. And alcohol dehydrates us. That's why we have to pee so often when we drink. You know, nobody wants to, you, once you start peeing, then you're peeing like every five minutes. And I think it's because of that that a therapist would be worried and tell you that it's kind of dangerous because of, that we're already dehydrating. We're like doing it two ways at once. We're drinking and we're purging. Um, and I know for me, when I have a client who drinks, because that's the most common thing I run into with just in my experience, um, I worry a lot about um, the, the potassium levels and the electrolytes, and I worry that the drinking, because it lowers our inhibitions, you know, that's why people can make bad decisions when we're drinking or when we're using drugs, our inhibitions come down, and then we binge and purge, or we exercise, or we just binge, or we cut, or because we don't have that 10 second, that golden 10 seconds to try to change because we're not even thinking about it, you know? Um, so that's to answer that um, question. Let me pull it up. And I want to give a shout out to everybody online posting questions. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and if any of you missed the beginning, this is uh, my friend Cara Braun. She posts videos on YouTube and she's been really helpful and she's been posting things on my site. And um, she's just here to share her story and her experiences um, with the topics we're addressing today. And um, so thanks, Cara. And, um, so thank you all for also tweeting questions. This is great. Um, I'm going to toggle. Do you have anything else to add, Car? Do you want me to toggle over to you for a minute? OK. OK. Sorry. I hate that I have to have you muted it. I don't like it to figure out the echo thing. Um, so OK. So one question I had, and this is actually something that, um, Car, I want some of your insight, too, because I don't, this is kind of tricky. This is a question that I've, I actually um, have a new client who I know is struggling with this herself. And I know that it is really hard. And the question is, how do you stop being picky about finding a new therapist when yours leaves? Or when yours, let's say, goes on maternity leave, or she gets hired at another place, or she has to move away. Or, I mean, I had clients that I used to see before I went back to graduate school. So I saw them when I was a counselor before I went and got my master's and I had to leave them and even though you take the time I mean we took like four sessions to kind of slowly talk about it and because it, it's sad it's a it's a loss of a relationship and it can be really hard and I know that transitions are difficult especially when we're working on something so um, how do we stop being so picky because it's just like anything in life no one can replace another person like there's not going to be another Kara. There's not going to be any, you know, no one's the same. We're, we're, we're unique and individual, every one of us. And so, I mean, from, from my standpoint, I guess, as a therapist, I would say that the best thing we can do is start looking for someone who feels comfortable. We're not looking for another, another Katie. I'm the only Katie, you know. There, everybody has a different way that they deal with clients and I think that opening yourself up to a new relationship is hard but it can be really worth it. Um, what do you think Cara? I'm going to unmute you here. Yeah I agree with you. Um, it's never going to be the same as the relationship you had with, with a therapist before but yeah yeah it is tough but yeah. Yeah I mean there's only there's only one of each person and so if we can work with them and you know we just do make the best with what we have and there are good therapists there's, there's plenty of them you know that it's not just that one person even though we really connected you know it's almost um, I always feel like I'll, you know I'll say to some of my clients when I get them in a treatment center when I used to work in the treatment center and they've left a therapist they really liked to go to treatment and that doesn't mean you lose your experience with that therapist. You miss them for a period of time. And I always, I always say to them, I'm like, you know what? Let's take that relationship for what it was. What did we learn? How did we grow? How much, I mean, how many things did you overcome? Let's celebrate the relationship, you know? Um, because that, to me, that can kind of help us through it. It's almost like instead of grieving it, grieving it we can... I don't know, we can love it for what it was. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because um, my DBT therapist, it was um, a contract for a, over a year. And when that ended, like we had a really good relationship and we still do. Um, we catch up um, every now and then um, just to see how I'm going and, and all that kind of thing. And it's just really good to be celebrating what I have achieved and, and seeing it like that, like it, it was necessary and, and I, I love it a bit. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. It is hard. <laughs> Uh, it is. Um, we're still getting an echo card. Do you have headphones by chance or no? Do you have headphones yeah. to use? Yep. Potentially. Do you want to? Put, let me see if that fixes it. Because then I don't have to mute you anymore. Sorry, everybody. There's an echo. Right. See if that helps. See if that helps. Yeah. Is that better? Is the echo gone? I don't hear it. I think it's fixed. Oh, wow. Okay. Thanks, honey. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Every time we have to fight with an echo. Um, okay, so on to more questions. Let me scroll down here so I don't miss any. Um, oh, this is a good question. This one came through. Um, I guess I just missed it. It was saying, can you be cured of a borderline personality disorder? And it's my belief that you can. I don't think it's, it's just like an eating disorder. We can be recovered from it. I mean, we're going to have to consistently fight. There, but there will come a time, like I always tell you, with everything, where in car, even has this own experience, that it will become second nature. We will do things without having to think about it. So to answer your question, Danielle Tenney on uh, Twitter, yes. And I'm assuming you'd agree, Cara? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. We just getting diagnosed does not mean that we can't overcome it. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, this is a good one. I'll actually, if you don't mind answering this one, Car, I have one from um, uh, Kirsty is no longer Anon on Twitter. Or yeah, on Twitter at Hope Whispers Try. Um, mm -hmm. She has a question. How do you tell your friends that saying things like I wish I could get rid of the food I just ate or anything that's triggering because a lot of people don't think about it and they'll say oh you know I wish I could just do something they can even use a term that we use for eating disorders um, and how how do we tell them that it's hurtful or that it's triggering um, yeah I still struggle with that but the people that I have in my life at the moment are um, like family and close friends so yeah I usually wouldn't talk to other people about it really but yeah I don't really know like, how okay. you would go about that. Yeah, That's okay I just thought I mean everybody struggles with this I hear this all the time um, and my advice to my clients is usually we have to learn how to talk about it and I know it's embarrassing our eating disorder says we should feel shameful and guilty and blah blah it tells us all sorts of horrible things but the truth is there's no shame in having an eating disorder there's no shame in struggling there there's the, the only thing that we should ever feel bad about is the the fact that um, people don't get it they don't understand yeah. right? but I guess the reason I even created this channel is so that people can get it so that we can spread the word, we can talk about it, people can understand because it's just ignorance. And yeah. I usually tell my clients to journal about it first. Start writing about how you would say it. Because when we practice, so we can say, let's say I'm going to the cafeteria for lunch, I have school, or at work, everybody goes to the little lunch room or work room or whatever. And I know there's going to be some lady there, and she always makes a comment about me not eating, me eating too much, where does the food go, whatever, right? There's going to be some kind of, I know it's going to be triggering. When I'm at home, I can sit down with my journal and I can say, you know, Susie from work will say this, what can I say back? And I'll practice. I'll say, um, I'll find Susie when she's by herself because I find that that's easier. We don't want to embarrass anybody and it's hard enough to talk. So I would do it on a separate occasion, like go to her desk or her office 
and just say, do you have a moment? You know, and we'll be nervous. Our heart will be beating, and we'll be, ah, I can't do this, but you can do it. We're just going to practice ahead of time. So we'll start with, you know, um, I don't know if you know this, and I would prefer you to keep this between the two of us, but I'm recovering from an eating disorder, and when you make comments at the lunchroom, it's just really hard for me. So um, I know that's a lot to ask, but if you could just, just try to keep that in mind, okay? And thank you for listening. You know? I mean, I know that, that makes us really nervous. You guys are like, I could never say that. Yeah. But it it's just practicing. It's just like anything. It's not going to happen right away. It's not going to come easily like we can just do it. But if these are our friends, I mean, Kirsty, if, if these are your friends, I think that we should start having the conversation. I know we don't want to, but it, people need to know so that they can be supportive. And you can tell them what you need from them. Um, and then we can get our needs met, right? People don't... Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Like, um, people can't read your mind. Yeah, you know, so. and we wish they could. I mean, mm. we do that. I mean, I even do that sometimes. I'll, I'll assume that people know what I'm thinking and feeling, but unless I tell them, they don't know for mm. sure. They can guess, but we only do, you know, we can only guess as well as we can guess. Okay, so I'm going to look and see um, other questions. Oh, this is a good one. I don't know if you have experience with this, Cara, but this is from Caitlin Bell, and she says, do you have any advice on how to deal with recovery when you live with a parent who also has, like, disordered eating or eating disorder-related issues? I have a lot of clients that struggle with this. I don't know if you've personally struggled with it. Um, or... No, nah, not really. I mean, like, mum, yeah, she's always been really skinny and stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's the same thing. It, it's hard. And I'll tell you why it's hard. Because many parents, the thing that I find so frustrating, and again, why I started doing what I'm doing now, is the fact that people... Um, like our mothers and our grandmothers, if they had an eating disorder, good luck getting help. Good luck finding somebody who even knew what that was. Um, it hasn't been recognized and dealt with properly for very long. And so the thing that makes it hard is that our mom may not have ever talked about it. And so, again, same thing with like telling our friends, we're going to have to start talking about it. And I know it's hard. But we can practice. We can journal. We can practice with a friend. If you have a friend that's really supportive and that knows about it, practice. Practice talking it out. Okay, you know, and then you can even say, well, I think my mom will freak out when I say this. So can we word it in a softer way? Because it's almost like any kind of relationship when we talk to somebody, we can say, I can't believe you did that. That was so frustrating. Ah. Or we can say, you know, that really hurt my feelings and this is why and um, you know you tell them the reason why because I, I was really sensitive that day and, and I'm feeling really hurt because you said that and that is something personal to me um, you know can you just try not to do that again? Two totally yeah different. and also that's like part of DBT is interpersonal effectiveness and there is something called dear man so and that was really helpful for me um, so yeah maybe like if you look that up and you can kind of see how you can word things and, and all that. Yeah, and just practicing soft language. It, it's, um, it, yeah, it's interpersonal effectiveness. It's ways, which it takes practice. But, mm. yeah, just I think that's why the journaling is so helpful. Because um, if we're taking time and we're practicing it, then we can kind of play out what we think is going to happen ahead of time. So I hope that answers that question. I know it's really hard. Um, but feel free, everybody else, feel free to share if you've had a really good success. Like, hey, my mom used to be bulimic, and she um, it's been really stressful, and so I've been working on it, and this really helped. Share your story. Let's, you know, you can post it on my website. You can share it on Twitter or on my comments below the live broadcast when we post it. Um, share your experiences, because we have a, a big voice. We can speak. We can share. We can learn from one another, um, and that's what gets so exciting. So it's six o'clock on the dot, but I'm going to do, if Cara has a little bit more time, do you want to do a few more questions? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So we'll do a few more questions. 
Um, and thank you all for tuning in and for all your questions. I love it. It's kind of exciting. I've got two computers up. That's why I'm doing this weird thing here. Um, oh, <laughs> she said, the stress tolerance is the worst. Thanks for addressing it. We knew that that was going to come up. Um, okay, let's see. I'm just scrolling through. Um, Oh, and Emma Kate had asked a similar question about how you focus on being healthy when your family is really weight obsessed and critical. And I think it kind of goes along with what we're talking about, talking to our mom about it or anybody, is we have to start talking about it. Do you think that is the same, Cara, too? Yes. Um, we're not exactly a family that's um, like weight obsessed, we're more obsessed about exercise and um, and there's always been in our family like appearance, that's always been like a, a big thing and and my sisters, they're fit, they, they're toned and and here I am struggling with that pressure and I developed an eating disorder because of it. Yeah, exactly because it, it, I find it interesting um, usually when we don't have like clear communication with the family or we've had something happen, like all the reasons I was talking about those little uh, kind of triggers to eating disorders and self-harm and BPD. Um, we have those things happen and then we end up focusing on our body and food and things like that because that could be the focus of our family. If everybody's mm. talking about working out and looking a certain way or mom's always on a diet or you know things like that. It definitely feeds that. So I think Emma I would just say um, I know I told you this before too, but just start practicing journaling about it um, and reaching out to others to get to get help, to have someone supportive to practice with um, and to have an ally. Um, and especially if there's one person in our family, like if you're close to your sister or if you're close to your brother or your dad or your mom, one of them, um, having an ally because they can speak up sometimes and you can't. I know, yeah, because uh, yeah, you, you're you really close with your sister, aren't you? Yeah, I've got two younger sisters and I'm really close to them. And like they're really supportive when I'm having a good day. Um, they're like, "Well, we're really proud of you," and and it's really good to get that encouragement. Yeah, well. we sometimes we just need that little boost, you know, mm. that we can do it. Um, okay, so I'm looking for. I'm gonna look for ED solutions. Sorry, I'm on my phone now. I've got like so many gizmos and gadgets going. Let's see. Um, ED solutions. Um, well, this is a good one. We'll do two more questions. Um, so the first one, I mean, this is from Crazy Megs. I don't know, Magdalena, she's contacting us. She has a question. How do you do it when you have so much stuff to work on? Like, we have self-harm, we have BPD, we have PTSD, we have eating disorder. How do we even manage? Um, do you want me to go first, Car? or do you want to go first? Um... I'll go first. <laughs> um, I also struggled with PTSD as well and it was always a battle as you know what to address first and I think usually it, it would be the one that's most affecting your life that would be number one and then and then just the other ones come in because I remember when I was in DVT and I was really struggling with my eating disorder it was almost like I, I could have left because I was struggling so much that the therapy was not going to benefit me. Yeah. Um, and there was like this other therapy, I can't remember what it was now, but um, they were advising me to go to that. But in the end, it, um, it all worked out. But yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I'll switch. I hate forgetting to switch over. Um, so I have to kind of agree with you, Car. I mean, I think that since it's all linked, I know that it feels like a lot of separate issues, but mm -hmm. I think finding a specialist, so if you find someone who works with eating disorders or self-harm, chances are that they also work with the, you know, the BPD portion of it and PTSD because I know that Rachel um, had asked a question about how BPD affects eating disorders and how they're, it's, it's connected, you know, and why is that? So I'll go over that, Rachel, when I finish this question, but um, I just wanted to say that I think for Meg's question about how we deal with it all, where do we start, I think finding someone who works with eating disorders is really where you'll get the most help. I know that that sounds really bizarre, but when I work with a client, I know, because I specialize in eating disorders, I know it's not about the food. 
that's not really the reason that you're there. It's because of communication struggles, which, guess what? That happens in self-harm, that happens in BPD, um, that happens with our PTSD. We have issues with communication, we feel, we have guilt, we have shame, we have all these emotions and we don't know how to express them. We feel like we have no right to feel them. And so what I would work with you on is learning that you have that right to feel however you feel. To help process it and to help, you know, do all of those things, if that makes sense. I hope that answers your question, Megs. I know it's hard, but they're all so connected that finding a specialist will really get the ball rolling. Um, and I think I think that's about it. Oh, um, and I'll, I'll kind of answer a little bit more of Rachel's question about how do I feel BPD affects eating disorders. I think it's all to do with communication and emotion and the fact that we struggle to communicate and feel our emotions, allow ourselves to feel our emotions and accept emotions for what they are. I think that, that that's why they're so connected. I hope that makes sense. Do you want to chime in? I know we already talked about this a little bit, Cara, but how do you think your BPD has affected your eating disorder? Well, um, yeah, it's really how I coped. Um, when I stopped self-harm, um, I kind of turned to my eating disorder and I still am struggling kind of with that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's hard. I mean, it kind of feeds one another. Um, mm. And yeah, they're all linked. Like you said, you stop one, one starts, it just kind of... the. They feed it. I guess the best way I can explain it is like the emotions. Um, it's all about our emotions and feeling that we have a right to feel the way we feel. And it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry. And BPD tells us it, we're working on that because it's we struggle with it. And in our eating disorder, we also feel like we don't have a right to feel the way we feel. Does that make mm. sense? I know sometimes it's like hard for me to get the thoughts out clearly and concisely, but I think that, that I think that's why. Um, and the last question I want to end on today is, um, I'll pull it up so I can see who it comes from, Gracie on Twitter asks, what, what should we do if we're struggling with school and lacking focus and motivation? So um, I think I think this is a good question. I get this a lot. Like, we're lacking motivation. We're struggling to focus. We don't know what to do. Um, what What do you think? What do you think, Cara? Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? You can go first. Okay. Um, are we still getting an echo? Okay. I'm going to mute you just this one last time. It's acting weird. Um, okay, so as far as um, motivation, I think I'll just talk about motivation as a whole because I think it really all is tied in together. So if we're lacking motivation for work or we're lacking motivation for school, what do we do? Now, I think, to be honest, and I know that a lot of you have watched my videos about eating disorders in school and how we do both, um, school will always be there. And sometimes we have to take a break. We have to quit our job or we have to take a leave of absence, we have to take a medical leave. Um, because working on our eating disorder, working on our self-harm, working on our BPD, it's a full-time job. It's really hard. I mean, Cara said it took her a long time. It's a lot of work. And to do, to deal with that and deal with all the other stuff that comes along with being a student, a teenager, uh, a working adult, or whatever we're doing, it, I mean, people have enough trouble just being us in our regular day, let alone dealing with all the things that we're working on. So my response is maybe it's time to take a break. I know that we don't want to stop school. I know that we don't want to get behind or feel out of place or odd, but I know that a lot of schools will um, work with you. And when you take leave and you take a medical leave, they'll have some summer classes you can take or your teachers will work with you to catch you up. Um, but I really think that sometimes we have to put 
our recovery first. And I know it's hard, but I'll tell you, it will it'll be so much easier um, because it's hard enough. And that's really my response. So I'm going to switch over to you, Cara. Um, I don't know. What, what's it? What are your thoughts? Um, this has been a struggle for me as well, um, trying to study while I was recovering. Um, I did take a lot of time off, like all up, it was a lot of time, but um, I, I stopped school, like uni, um, halfway through this year and, and that was so I could focus fully on recovery, so, and, and I actually needed to do that because recovery was that like, difficult. Yeah. It's it's hard. I mean, we don't we don't say that we have to work at it all the time just to say that. It's the truth, and that's why mm -hmm. there's education. That's why there's residential. That's why a lot of therapists, like even me, I'll see clients two times a week when they're first out of treatment and they're seeing their dietitian. So think about all the appointments you have, as well as all the emotional work. We're doing. <laughs> so um, anyway, that I guess. Um, I think that's it for now. I mean, it's six eleven, and um, I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, but I want everybody to know on Twitter that I will get on and I will answer all the questions that have come through that I didn't have a chance to answer live. Um, and I want to thank you all for tuning in to our live broadcast. Um, it was great to do this. I get excited. It's it's more fun to me, to be honest, to to just talk it out, and you get to see me live, and I get to get your questions live, and it's it's kind of exciting to get our questions answered quickly and you know right away um, and Cara thank you so much for being on I know that we took some time out of your day um, but thank you so much for for taking the time and spending with us and sharing your experience you have no idea how powerful your voice is so thanks for doing that um, and thanks everybody else for being on and sharing your experiences and leave your comments below when we post this um, I would love to know your thoughts or if you have a different answer to a question that maybe Cara and I gave and you think that something else worked for you, share your experience. Um, yeah, and we'll be doing this again sometime soon and I'll let you all know. And um, thanks again for tuning in. Thank you, Cara. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.